last lecture and last seminar, we talked about the various fiscal programs, transfer programs that have been established to help support Canada's social union, the network of social programs that exist to ensure that Canadians receive comparable levels of uh, public services at comparable rates of taxation. Today we'll delve a little bit more deeply into what exactly is that social union and talk about whether it in fact provides those ties that bind, as, as some suggest it does, in terms of uh, creating a national um, system of, of social services across Canada. It's become part of, of the Canadian identity, according to many observers. So today's objectives are to describe what exactly is this social union and then to go on to talk about uh, how Canada's social union has evolved over time. And I'll leave it up to you uh, to decide whether you believe that this evolution has been positive or negative, and there's certainly or, uh, arguments to be made on, on both sides of that ledger. So what do we mean by Canada's social union? Uh, at one level, it, it refers to the shared sense of common purpose when it comes to supporting the most vulnerable members of society and to establishing common standards in the treatment of Canadian citizens when it comes to social programs across the country. On another level, it refers to the network of social services themselves uh, that exists at both uh, the provincial and the federal level. As you've learned through introductory classes in Canadian politics and Canadian federalism, um, the provinces have control over things like education, hospitals, charities, local matters, and property and civil rights. And as we discussed earlier in this class, they spend over 75% of all of their uh, expenditures on the social union, including all of those programs I just listed. The federal government spends 70% of its uh, expenditures uh, on areas of the social union as well. This includes not just the transfers that, that they send to, to provinces to pay for health care and, and social services, but also the federally administered programs like employment insurance, pensions, um, and family allowances, child benefits, scholarships, and so on that they've established through the use of, of the federal spending power. Uh, which raises some real questions as to how governments will coordinate all of this spending and all of this program development. And it's one of the bigger challenges in, in, in Canadian um, public administrations to figure out how to uh, prevent the type of overlap that uh, can occur from time to time in Canada, uh, which results in duplication of services, and to keep governments from working across purposes with, uh, with one another. Uh, it could be that the federal government establishes a program that draws funding or priorities or attention away from areas that other provincial governments are, are trying to uh, draw attention to or address. In general, though, the Canadian governments have uh, operated under one of three uh, modes of interaction. The first, classic federalism, as we've learned, um, most closely approximates what the, Fed what the Harper government has called open federalism, which is to leave each order of government to do its own work uh, without interfering in, uh, in, in the work of others. This classic mode of federalism has, has been um, seldom followed in practice, and, and in particular in the areas of, of, of social programming, but also as we'll just talk about next week in terms of economic programming as well. Collaborative federalism uh, is another mode, one of the three modes that uh, the governments have followed to, to uh, coordinate the social union. It involves establishing things like shared cost programs, joint decision making and policy development processes, and often takes place at the functional level, in other words, uh, among bureaucrats. The third mode of government coordination is what one might call combative or competitive federalism. And this, uh, as we've discussed at great length, involves the use of the federal spending power without, without consulting provincial governments, um, the establishment of hourglass federalism or boutique federalism programs, and so on. But in general, that's how governments have, um, have interacted with one another when it comes to uh, developing Canada's social welfare state. Let's take a look at a couple of case studies to see how uh, Canada's social union has developed and how governments have approached their interactions with one another very differently over time. Most people believe that uh, the Canadian healthcare system was born in Saskatchewan, which is n in fact not true. Um, the first notion of universal healthcare in Canada came through the federal government under Mackenzie King at the tail end of, of World War II, as most governments were across the globe. People were looking for to establish uh, more comprehensive systems of, of government support for the most vulnerable in society, but also universal programs like healthcare for everyone. 
and the King Liberals released a series of green papers or green books in 1945 that laid the foundation for this. And they also established a series of national health grants in 1948 which went out to provinces to help establish uh, what would become um, the various laboratories of, of healthcare innovation across Canada. One of these uh, was in Saskatchewan where Tommy Douglas's CCF precursor to the NDP, CCF government established Canada's first system of hospitalization insurance in 1947. Uh, the rest of Canada watched intently to see whether this hospitalization insurance program, which the Douglas government embraced as socialized medicine, uh, would actually take hold, would be successful, would be popular. And it, it was. Uh, and other provinces began to uh, mimic um, that particular policy innovation. and. The federal government took notice in 1957 when, when the Diefenbaker government, supported by, uh, was a minority, supported by the New Democrats, established Canada's first National Hospitalization Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act, or HIDS, uh, in 1957. HIDS was a, a shared cost program that allowed provinces to spend 50 cents and receive 50 cents in return from the federal government to help build up this new hospitalization insurance system. The next big innovation came in 1962, not in Ottawa again, but in, in Saskatchewan, where uh, the Woodrow Lloyd government, Woodrow Lloyd succeeded uh, Tommy Douglas when Tommy Douglas moved to the federal level, and they established in Saskatchewan Canada's first system of physician services. Uh, and the covering physician services was a big part of the Pearson minority government's establishment uh, of the Medicare system in 1966. Medicare was a, a, sh a shared cost program, much like HIDS was, but again expanded the scope of what uh, healthcare, universal healthcare system would be in Canada. The next big change, as you've seen the picture here demonstrates, uh, was the Trudeau government's innovation in, 1950, in sorry, 1977 when they established uh, the EPF program, or Established Programs Financing, which uh, instead of being a shared cost program was a block grant program. Uh, that sent money directly to the provinces to pay for not just health care but post-secondary education and, and, and a wealth of other uh, other programs. This block grant was unconditional. Provinces could spend it on, on how, how they chose as long as it was within the, that broad envelope of, of, uh, of sector spending like health care. This was made conditional in 1984, though, with the establishment of the Canada Health Act, which, as we described, established five national standards uh, which provinces would have to abide by if they wanted to receive that funding. The next big innovation occurred in 1996 when the Chrétien government established uh, the CHST, the Canada Health and Social Transfer, combining uh, CAP, which we'll discuss in a moment, the Canada Assistance Plan, with EPF, and um, dramatically reducing the amount of, of money that would flow out to the provinces. Later on, as we'll see, the government, the Chrétien government would establish a national health accord, followed up uh, by massive investments by the Martin government, in, which became the 10-year uh, health accord that we'll talk about at great length later. The Harper government for its part uh, has abandoned the health accord approach to uh, to funding the social union. Um, they've, they've put what they feel is a, a sustainable path, uh, sustainable predictable path for healthcare spending and, and, and healthcare financing which we've discussed at length last time. For their part, the premiers, as we've discussed, have established their own working group, Healthcare Innovation Working Group, as part of the Council of the Federation, led uh, initially by Premier Robert Giz, who's pictured here uh, from Saskatchewan, and to his right, your left, uh, Premier Wall of Saskatchewan, who are the initial leaders of this particular Healthcare Innovation Working Group. Now, this trajectory on healthcare has draws many parallels with social assistance in Canada or welfare. Um, over time, the, the social assistance system in Canada has evolved from one that was based largely on charities and churches to nascent programs that the provinces introduced um, in the lead up uh, to World War II. Afterwards, as we know, uh, the federal government began investing heavily in, in the development of the social welfare state through, the, through a constitutional amendment that they received uh, permission from the provinces to uh, to accept responsibility for unemployment insurance, pensions, family allowances, and, and limited cost share programs. The major, first major innovation came again uh, in the Pearson minority government uh, in, in 1966 
when they established a shared cost program known as the Canada Assistance Plan, or, or CAP. This was a needs-based program. Uh, in other words, provinces received their share of funding based on the amount of need that they had within their province when it came to providing social assistance. They barred residency restrictions from being placed on the funding, meaning that Canadians would receive CAP uh, programs regardless of where uh, they lived or where they moved. And there would have to be an appeals machinery established within each province for folks that felt like they weren't being treated fairly under, under the, the province's welfare regime. These were the three uh, largest sets of uh, conditions that the federal government placed on, on, on CAP funding. Uh, really, the first major change to the CAP system came in 1990 when the Mulroney government placed what's known as the CAP on CAP um, and, and transformed it from a shared cost program into, um, in, into a conditional grant program. As mentioned, the Chrétien Liberals rolled the CAP, Canada Assistance Plan, and EPF together to form the CHST in 1995. Uh, it is worth noting that throughout this period, there was no equivalent of a Canada Health Act for welfare spending. Um, and this, uh, some critics hold, has resulted in a race to the bottom or a slouching to the bottom uh, among different provinces because there are no national standards to help uh, prevent uh, governments from gutting social programs in, in, in favor of other, uh, other priorities. More on that in a moment. Let's talk a little bit about the federal government's response in 1995-96. Uh, as we discussed in the late 1970s, the Trudeau government came to the conclusion that the Keynesian orthodoxy, the approach to um, counter-cyclical spending and the growth of the welfare state had fallen out of favor that early. But in 1995-96, um, the neoliberal approach to governance had really taken hold across, uh, across Canada, across much of the Western world. Uh, there were calls from critics that uh, the welfare state had become a nanny state and public pressure was being placed on the federal government in particular to scale back on its cost shared programs. And uh, the constitutional preoccupation during, uh, of governments during the mega constitutional period had really distracted folks from the massive um, uh, growth of, of welfare state programs ac across Canada, and social programs across Canada. So as a result, the federal government, in its efforts to arrest the, the federal deficit, began cutting government spending. They ended cost-shared programs and they lowered provincial transfers without uh, consulting provinces. They also increased uh, EI eligibility and raised CPP, or Canada Pension Plan, premiums at the same time. They did establish some national standards to prevent a race to the bottom, but overall the effect of the 95-96 cuts was not just to transform uh, what were shared cost programs into conditional grants, but also to massively reduce the amount of funding that went, um, that went to the provinces in the form of these transfers. You can see here in the red square from 95-96, which was the last large budget year from the provincial perspective, a massive uh, reduction, unilateral reduction in, in spending through 1997-1998. Uh, the green box here demonstrates where the federal government began reinvesting in areas of, of provincial jurisdiction through these transfers and began receiving public credit for doing so. Uh, the, the Chrétien government and his his um, successor, Paul Martin, received great public accolades for reinvesting and saving the, the Canada health system, healthcare system in, in particular. This, be, this was, as you can imagine, uh, not a popular move and not a popular public reaction among, among provincial governments who were left uh, holding the bag, as it were, for the federal cuts uh, that happened in 95-96. And, you know, the, the provincial response was was swift. Um, it happened through uh, the annual Premier's Conference to begin with in the, a the APC where there were calls, public calls on the federal government to stop offloading fe previous federal responsibilities on the provinces. They um, insisted that the federal government was uh, offloading this political and fiscal responsibility onto the provinces for, for trying to uh, save the, the federal budget, they were, they were actually causing all kinds of downstream effects for Canadians where there were, so there were several hospital closures, for example, school closures and, and so on. And this was actually exacerbating the vertical fiscal imbalance and, and intergovernmental relations tensions at the time. 
The provinces also insisted that the federal unilateral moves in the 95-96 budget, uh, which came again unannounced, uh, could not happen again. And there had to be some kind of ground rules established to prevent the federal government from having these immediate effects on, on provinces without, without consulting with them. And this move to restrict federal unilateralism resulted in the signing of the Social Union Framework Agreement in 1999, or the, or the SUFA. It was signed by 11 premiers and the Prime Minister. It uh, was not signed by the government of Quebec, uh, which is interesting because the whole push to limit the federal spending power and limit federal unilateralism historically has been one that Quebec has championed. And the move towards a social union framework agreement itself was actually initiated by the Bouchard government in Quebec. They didn't end up signing on for reasons that we'll talk about in a moment. What were some of the highlights of this social union framework agreement? Well, Section 1 dealt with uh, several principles, which you see on your screen. All Canadians are equal, and that governments should work together to meet the needs of Canadians. There was a restatement of the equalization principle that all Canadians should have access to comparable services. There was a recommitment on everybody's part to the five principles of the Canada Health Act. And there was uh, a commitment to several principles when it comes to funding social programs. They had to be adequate, affordable, stable, and sustainable. And those are terms that we talked about in, in seminars past that are quite contentious and uh, are defined differently by various orders of government. There was also recognition of Aboriginal treaty and self-government rights, but only in a very notional, broad sense. There was no uh, meat put on those bones, as it were. And that's something that we can talk about later in the seminar. The second section of SUFA dealt with mobility within Canada, which suggested that no new barriers should be placed uh, in front of Canadians who want to move from, from one part of the country to the other when it comes to their social services, and that any existing residency-based uh, barriers would be removed within three years, uh, with the caveat that unless those, those uh, barriers can be demonstrated to be in compliance with the general spirit of SUFA. Uh, there was also a, a commitment to abide by the agreement on internal trade, which is something we'll talk about in, in our economic union um, seminar as well. Section 3 of SUFA dealt with public accountability and transparency. SUFA and its provisions would be self-monitored by government. There would be a commitment to sharing best practices across jurisdictions. There would be mutual recognition of uh, the federal government's involvement or funding of provincial uh, of, of provincial programs and if the provinces were receiving uh, results then everyone who participated in that program would would, um, would receive full credit. There would be public participation in, in the review and development of, of, of social programs. Overall transparency and there would be an internal appeals process again like, like there was in, in CAP to, to ensure that Canadians had recourse if they felt that the social services that they were entitled to were not being uh, provided to them in, in an equitable fashion. There was a commitment in Section 4 to work in partnership for all Canadians, uh, which as you can see on your screen involved reciprocal notice and consultation, meaning that big changes to um, federal programs uh, or provincial programs would not be made without at least notifying um, the other order or the people that would be, the other governments that would be affected by it. This is, Section 5 is where the Quebec government pulled offside of SUFA and because there was a recognition, and the words are right there in front of you, a recognition that the use of the federal spending power under the Constitution has been essential to the development of Canada's social union. This was something that the Chrétien government insisted on being in SUFA and something that Quebec insisted could not be there. First, they don't feel that the federal spending power is constitutional and second, they don't feel it's been essential to the development of Canada's social union. So this is where the Bouchard government walked away. However, the beyond that one statement, there were actually quite a few bear, uh, breaks that were put on the use of the federal spending power through SUFA that the federal government would, first of all, have to consult one year prior to making, quote, significant funding changes, like those ones that we saw to the CHT in 95, 96, that there would be no new Canada-wide initiatives involving transfers without a majority of provin provinces on side, and that there would be three months notice and offer to consult on any new direct spending initiative. Uh, if the federal government wanted to spend in areas of provincial jurisdiction, they would have to give three months notice to provinces and offer to consult with them. These were uh, many, these met many of the 
uh, conditions that Bourassa had made back in the Meech Lake, uh, during the Meech Lake round of, of, of constitutional reform, and dating all the way back to 1971 with the Vic Victoria Charter. But some felt it didn't go far enough. Um, number six, the dispute and res avoidance and resolution mechanism was built into SUFA to uh, encourage folks uh, in various governments to work together to ensure that if there were any disputes with regard to social funding in particular that would be resolved in a timely manner. And that the SUFA would be uh, uh, reviewed in, through Section 7 uh, through a series of public consulta consultations after three years. So SUFA established, again, a, a series of ground rules uh, for governments to follow when it came to building and revising Canada's social union over time. Um, it, did really, it did reveal some real tensions in intergovernmental relations in Canada. It revealed as many as I think that it solved. Um, different governments went in with different emphases in which, with regard to which section was most important to them. Some still question the formality of the agreement. It's an intergovernmental agreement that was signed by governments back in 1999. The, the, the extent to which it still applies today is, is unknown. It's not as if you, if you see that a program isn't being implemented properly according to the spirit of SUFA. It's not as if you can bring up SUFA in court and say the government is not behaving as it said it would. Um, so in that sense, it was more of a, a moral, a set of moral commitments made by all uh, governments involved, more than an intergovernmental, uh, formal intergovernmental agreement. Um, there were real questions as to whether SUFA would hold up in times of economic distress, and I challenge you to think about how the Harper government's approach uh, to open federalism has in some ways respected the spirit of SUFA and in other ways not. Um, there was a sense that SUFA was intended to help guide functional federalism, uh, in other words, at the bureaucratic level more than it was uh, at the summit level, and I challenge you to think about that as well. The last major tension, of course, was that uh, the Quebec government didn't sign on to SUFA, uh, and a as a result it was a classic example of 911 federalism where the federal government would have one agreement with the nine English-speaking provinces and a separate side uh, uh, deal, in this case not a formal agreement, but a, a separate side understanding with Quebec on how it would handle social programs with them. And, and folks could make the argument that the federal government's treatment of Quebec under the Canada Jobs Grant is, is an example of that, that 911 style of asymmetrical federalism as well. This said, there have been several um, key initiatives and successful ones under SUFA. Uh, the Early Childhood Development programs that have been launched across Canada, ECD programs, uh, the National Child Benefit, uh, and labor market agreements with regard to persons with disabilities have all been um, orchestrated under the guise of SUFA, and um, governments who are signatories to the agreement have held those up as, as success stories. The provincial reaction, of course, uh, extended beyond simply uh, st establishing SUFA as a, as a way of uh, preventing what happened in 95, 96 from happening again. They also formed the Council of the Federation, uh, which was meant to establish a common front against uh, Ottawa in a more institutional fashion, but also to establish the premiers as leaders in the social policy realm. And we've seen that through the development of the Healthcare Innovation Working Group uh, in particular. So that's what we've done today. We've talked about what the social union uh, is in Canada, not only this, the spirit of it or as, as, a, you know, as something that ties Canadians together, but also in terms of the network of social services like uh, health care and, and, and welfare and social security. And we've also talked about how it's evolved over time. And I still leave this as an open question for you as to whether you think that the evolution has been an overall, uh, had an overall positive effect on, on Canadian social programs, on Canadian democracy, or whether there's still uh, room for improvement.